Let's get started. So um, I put a funny name. The name of the talk is called uh, Sport and Pastime. Uh, but the content is about, of course, lattice model simulation and some of, part, some of it will be related with CFT. But I, as always, I need to explain what this name is about. So a past, uh, a, a sport and a pastime is actually a phrase from Quran, as, as you see here. Just to show that uh, this life probably is not so important. <laughs> Just take it easy. Um, <laughs> but this is actually not how I get to know this phrase. Actually, I, I get to know this phrase from this picture, this novel. The novel is called A Sport and a Pastime. It's by this uh, American uh, novelist, James Sachs. So it's an it's a erotic book. It's a dirty book, actually, but it's a good book. It's a good book in the sense that um, it's, um, right now it's considered a modern classic of, uh, of literature in the sense that this is about imagination. It's about how you know the, the, the author just used his imagination to create this story. But the point is that he wants to use that imagination to deliver the message. Of course, the message is not important for us physicists. What is important for us, at least to me, the imagination. So what I want to say from the talk is that how we use our imagination, you know, follow his example, try to design better lattice models to simulate um, the, the, the new physics which we are compiled, like this also, which we are compiled to create. So this is actually how I make the connection. Then please go to the next page. Okay, so actually, because of this book, we, so, so the talk, most part of the talk today was already in this paper we just wrote recently, it was kind of a review paper. I just followed the example, I just call it a spot and pastime. So that paper reviewed this spin fermion lattice model SYK model and the uh, quantum Marie lattice model. So, so, so if you like, you can read the paper, but um, let's talk about this, uh, this content I, I'm going to discuss in, in, in this talk. So please go to the next page. Yeah, I'm sorry to, uh, okay, so the real content. So since uh, this time we have a better, lo longer time than the previous time that happened in PI, so now we can talk about two part. The first part, was the lattice model design, the imagination of fermion models that we study on Fermi liquid. We study, you know, matter field, coupled to gauge field and so on and so forth. And the second part was about uh, interacting spins or boson models that also we use Monte Carlo simulation to study, to show the fractionization, the example of fractionization. And uh, later on, we move to the quantum Daimler model, which actually has some connection with the Rydberg atoms. So as I can tell, so many, actually few people in the audience are, are my collaborators. And this is the paper, the paper I'm going to discuss was a paper we worked out, worked, worked out together. But now let me try to uh, link them through this spirit of a uh, sport and pastime. So please, uh, please go to the next page, yeah. So the first part, yes, the, the first part, about the fermion model, right? Then the fermion model, so I'm a Monte Carlo person. So the fermion model is about using determinant quantum Monte Carlo models to study this fermion uh, lattice model, uh, quantum Monte Carlo method to study this, this fermion lattice models. Of course, um, um, I won't go to much, much details, but the point is that the way we do it is to, to write down the partition function of these models into some fermion determinant. And in the determinant, I have a lot of matrix multiplications and the matrix element are the auxiliary field I introduce to decouple the fermion interaction. I basically translate the interacting problem into a non-interacting problem for each realization of my auxiliary field. So in a pictorial way, what we are solving, for example, if we want to solve a 2D square lattice Hubbard model, what I'm solving is a L by L 2D versus beta. I'm solving a three-dimensional object all these blue and red balls are the auxiliary field that I'm going to sample. Each of these cube give me one configuration and I just flip these spins to generate the new configuration as a Markov chain is going. That's our simulation. Actually, that's how people solve Hubbard model, for example, all these years. Now, please go to next page, yeah. Please uh, go to ne next page, yes. So, but uh, the way we solve, the way we design model was slightly different. We design a model that um, we do not solve Hubbard. We do not decouple the Hubbard U, for example. What we do is we explicitly write down the bosonic 
interaction model, in bosonic model by itself is interacting and a couple of fermions into this bosonic model. And in this way, I can generate a few interesting situations. For example, I can generate itinerant quantum cradle point. I can generate a quantum cradle point from a Fermi surface, a paramagnetic metal to a Fermi surface, which has anti-paramagnetic order. And what I am interest, interesting, interested was the quantum critical, critical point in between, because I know at the quantum critical point, this model will generate me non Fermi liquid. And, uh, and this one, this model also give us the, 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 the access to explore pseudo gap and superconductivity if I crank up my bosonic field, if I crank up the interaction between Fermi and bosons. And uh, if I translate, if I change the boson from the, you know, the real boson or the ON boson to, to gauge field, I can generate a more exotic state of matter of, of circular metal Fermi arc, UN gauge field coupled with Dirac Fermi, uh, Dirac uh, spin on uh, uh, dispersion, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of freedom we can play here. So let's uh, please go to the next page. Yeah. So, so the model, you know, you know, in the at the lattice level, so what the model is about was about was in the first line was Hamiltonian. What I'm simulating is three fermions, you know, with some dispersion, and I have a bosonic model which by itself has its own dynamics governed by this chi naught, by this chi zero. So I can tune the, the 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 wave vector of the bosons. I can tune the dynamics of the bosons. I can tune the boson to the critical point. I put the fermion to on this boson at the critical point. And this critical fluctuation of the bosons will mediate effective interaction between fermions. And that coupling between fermion and the bosons was realized in the last term that I have a fermion bilinear, usually I have a fermion bilinear dot product with a bosonic vector field, if I like, if you like. So that was the model. So I have a free fermion, I have an interacting boson, I couple them together. So that's what I'm interested. In. And for those of you in the audience, I think these are. Uh, these are very, they are very rich literature in this type of spin fermion coupled models, where there are quite a few very good RG type of papers. Um, and what we are trying to do was to see whether we can verify the prediction or the hypothesis that was put up in this RG analysis. Because at the critical point, the system by itself is nevertheless a strongly coupled system. So let's go to the next page. The simplest model, the early model that we start back then was this uh, simple icing, transverse field icing coupled to Fermi surface type of models. So the model was, the Hamiltonian has three terms as I showed in a previous slide. I have a free fermion model, Fermi surface. Um, and in this case, I have two layer of fermions just to avoid the same problem. I have two layer, two copy of fermions. That's why in the HF, the fermion has a, a subscript, both site, spin, and the layer in this is, but the layer here is a copy. And then um, I have a transverse field icing model, which is in you know, an intermediate layer. So I have a transverse icing field icing model, which has a ferromagnetic interaction subjected to a transverse field. So this model is very simple. We know that the phase diagram that at a small field at low temperature, the icing spin ordered. So the coupling was realized in this model in a way that the icing spin SZ coupled to fermion SZ for each layer. So basically the effect is that once the icing spin is ordered, this order will split the Fermi surface, generate a ferromagnetic metal. And once the icing spin was polarized by the transverse field to the X direction, this coupling is effectively zero. So the Fermi surface go back to the original paramagnetic Fermi surface. So with this to put it together, the phase diagram is showing I mean, the phase diagram, the schematic of phase diagram was showing on the up, you know, in the upper, in the in the right upper right part. The actual phase diagram was showing in the in the, in, the, in, the, in the lower right part. So the phase diagram only has two axes, temperature, and the transverse field. So I fix all the other terms. For example, I fix the hopping of the fermion as one. I first fix the chemical potential. I fix the coupling between fermion and bosons. Other here, boson is icing spins. I fix the coupling. So what I'm seeing is that. When temperature is low, when the transverse field is small, as I said, the icing spin will order. The, icing, the order of the icing spin will split the Fermi surface, which you is showing in the inset, will split the Fermi surface, gives me this ferromagnetic metal. Once the icing spins was polarized to the x direction, the coupling is zero, 
the Fermi surface go back to the original degenerate situation. So in this way, I can generate a paramagnetic metal to a ferromagnetic metal. And what I was interested back then was what happened close to the quantum creative origin. Then let's go to the next page, please. Um, so what happens, you know, for those of you who are actually familiar with this now from liquid literature, what was the central topic discussed is how the self-energy of the fermions scale as you move towards quantum critical point. More precisely, how the self-energy, you know, vanishes as a function of a frequency. So here I'm writing the frequency in, in the Madhubara axis. This is Madhubara frequency. So for this Fermi liquid I have designed, this has a ferromagnetic quantum critical point. The proposal was that the self-energy of these fermions at the quantum, I mean, towards moving towards the quantum critical point will vanish at the function of frequency is a fractional power. The power is smaller than one. So for a Fermi liquid, the power is one. For the non-Fermi liquid, the power is smaller than one. And, and in particular, in this case, the power is two over three. So that was the prediction for this icing type of quantum critical point. And what we get in the simulation was showing in the right. So what I get was, so what I'm plotting in the, in the right, in the panel B in the right was the imaginary part of the fermion self-energy as a function of Madhubara frequency. So what do we get? This state, this, these dots are the data. The data actually not vanishing. The data does not go to zero with a fractional power. The data is very mildly divergent, as you can see from the plot. So the different uh, symbols means different temperature. So the one over T, so the, the small T is the hopping, it's energy unit, which is one. One over T is a beta. So the larger the beta, the lower the temperature. The real data actually slightly diverging, not, 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 uh, not converging, but diverging. So this was a puzzle, actually. You, know, you see, the, the, the model we, have, we already know in 2017, you know, uh, so it takes us to 2020 to understand why it is so. So the way we understand it fully. So as I told you, this prediction of the non-Fermi liquid self-energy as a function of frequency, uh, the self-energy goes as a function of frequency to a fractional power, actually happens precisely at the zero temperature. So all the RG analysis back then was a, only an, analyze the quantum part of the fermion self-energy. The real simulation, what we have been performed was a finite temperature simulation. We do the past integral. So this is always with a finite beta. Although we scale beta with system sets, but it's still finite. So that means that the real data, what we see here, contains both the quantum part of the self-energy as well as the thermal part of the self-energy. So the previous analysis of saying the self-energy is, is a fractional power is only for the quantum part. The previous, previous analysis has not analyzed the thermal part. So we sit down, we sit down with, uh, with Andrei Trubkov and his post of Avi, I think Avi now is back to Israel, that we try to discuss, I mean, try to figure out a way how to analyze the thermal part. And the way from our particular setting is that the thermal part in this setting should shows a very mild divergence, alpha over omega. Alpha is a, is a constant, is a, is a very mild, is a very slowly varying function of temperature over omega. So it, it is indeed a divergent. Of course, this analysis comes with a condition. The condition is that you know, the effective coupling G bar was showing here, and uh, the temperature itself should be much smaller than the Fermi energy and the Fermi energy itself. So this has to be satisfied. Another condition was that the value of the self-energy, the, 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 the sigma itself has to be also small. So as you, as you see in the data, that it, there is a very mild diverging, but the data itself is actually small. So all this condition, when all this condition met, that uh, what, uh, what has been using to derive this one over omega divergence was uh, what I think what uh, Andrew called is a modified Eliashberg type of calculation. So they can derive the thermal part of the self-energy which has one over omega. And then once that part has been neglected or subtracted, you will expose 
the quantum part, which shows this fractional power with power smaller than one. So that's all I'm saying is this, this is analysis and the, the, the way to an analyze the data is in the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. So now, so, so this is actually how we analyze, analyze the data. So as I said, the self energy has two parts, thermal part and quantum part. Thermal part goes one over omega, quantum part go to omega to the power of two thirds. So now if I multiply omega on both sides of the equation, so omega multiplied with self energy should give me a constant plus omega F is a constant that depends on, on my lattice parameters, multiply with omega to the power of five over three. So now if I plot my diverging data, you know, with the data which is in the middle, upper middle panel, if I plot the data in a different way, I plot data with omega multiplied with the self energy versus omega to the power of five over three. If I plot in this way, it's the same data that I see this straight line. So this straight line is a predicted form of the whole self energy. The straight line is straight because I plot the axis, axis is omega to the power of five over three. So the, so the slope is this omega f to the power of one third. And the intercept of these all different straight lines is alpha. So the, the different lines means that the simulation was performed at a different temperature and the different theta. Theta means I chose different position on the Fermi surface. So there are different, all the Fermi surface is critical. This is ferromagnetic. I can choose different positions, but they have different constant. So now with this intercept, I can read off this alpha. And now what I'm doing is that I can really subtract off this thermal part that was the upper right panel of this, uh, of this plot, of, of the plot. That if I always use omega subtract alpha over omega n, I will review the quantum part of the self energy. That was the data. That was also this dash line. So the asymptotics of the dash line goes to this omega to the power of two thirds. And you can see now actually our data, which is finite temperature, finite system size, just barely touch the quantum limit. So of course we didn't know this all this beforehand. So we you know, the simulation was performed by, by you know, with, with, uh, with, with, uh, with as low as, as, as low, as low as possible, the, 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 the temperature, but we didn't know where, when we do the simulation, we didn't know where was the asymptotic. So we, we did this simulation after the, I mean, we, after analysis, we see actually our simulation was not good enough still to capture the true quantum part, but it's already showing a trend. So that's actually, this is the first model we can see the signatures of the predicted non-Fermi liquid self-energy. So that's the first model. And let's go to the, the, the next page. Okay, so once we know that, now life becomes slightly easier. So we know, we how can I amplify it, the condition I have to match to review the quantum part as much as possible. One way to amplify is that to change the boson part from the I transverse field icing to a quantum rotor model. So this is the same model or the same setting that the two layer of fermions coupled to the intermediate layer of critical boson. Now the boson model is no longer a transfer the field icing, but a quantum rotor model. So the boson model, the bosons has a O2 symmetry. But the coupling of course is still on site. I use a fermion spin dot product with the boson uh, uh, spin, if you like. Of course, now you have the X cyan cosine term. So now this is, um, you know, the, the bosonic field, it's a vector field. I couple this together and I can still do the same simulation. I can see, of course, you know, for those of you who are familiar with quantum rotor model, you have a U term, which is the angular moment of the rotors. You have a T term, which was determined the X, Y order, if you like, right? So then you can see that, um, you know, in a phase diagram, which is in, in the upper middle chart, that when the U is very small, my ground state should be a ferromagnetic order, should be a, you know, a 2D, uh, it's, it's, it's an XY order at the ground state. At the finite temperature in the region one, I have an XY phase. As U increases, when U become larger, I will have a disordered phase. And in between, I have this two plus one. You know, if I only have the rotor model itself, it should be a two plus one um, uh, XY quantum critical point. The interesting thing is above this quantum critical point, what do I see? Do I see non Fermi liquid? And we do see. So here the prediction is that this, the omega quantum 
sigma, sorry, the sigma quantum, the self-energy quantum, is no longer, it's still a fractional power of the multiplier frequency, but not two thirds because the change of symmetry is one half. So that was a prediction. And again, if we do the simulation, if I see the raw data, this was in the upper, upper right chart, the self-energy still see a divergence, still show a divergence. So again, you know, that's, but now I know this is because of the thermal part. Now, as you can see in the expressions in the lower left part that I again separate my self-energy from thermal and quantum, thermal has the same shape. Quantum has a omega to the power two thirds times a function of, 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 of a frequency. That now if I subtract the quantum, uh, so, sorry, subtract the, the thermal part, if I use the omega sigma minus alpha over omega versus omega to the power of one half, the data now really follow the quantum part, not only follow the, you know, the finite frequency quantum part, but also really enters a symptotic part. I see the omega to the power of one half. So this, you know, is it how we improve, how the, how the imagination play the game. Now we can improve the, this, this simulation. So now please go to the next uh, page. Yeah. So not only, not only the, 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 the non-Fermi liquid, now, if I, you know, if I enhance the onset the coupling between the Fermi and the boson, so in all the previous discussion, the coupling K in this case denoted by the K was one, but the coupling is weak, relatively weak. Now, if I enhance it to four, so it's four times larger, that, uh, you know, the quantum critical, used to be that the quantum critical point now was covered by a symmetry breaking phase. So what I mean is, that in this phase diagram, what you see here, it, in the previous slide, it was, uh, you know, T, Y axis is, is temperature, X axis was U. When U is small, I have a ferromagnetic phase. When U is large, I have disorder phase. And in between, I have a quantum critical point. Now, once I enhance the coupling between Fermi and the bosons, the thing, what happened is that the quantum critical point was covered by a superconductivity phase. And above the superconductivity phase, there's this pseudo gap region regime where you can see the density of state is doing funny, funny things. So what are the funny things is about is that now if I sit, for example, at U equals six, for example, now if I go down in temperature, so what you, what you see, you should see the, the lower left part what's the local density of state of fermions, be how it behave along this process. Basically I'm going down in temperature. So the, the different line, this plot was different temperatures. The highest temperature is one over four of the Hopin T. The lowest temperature is one over 20 of the Hopin T. So what you see is that uh, now, the, now the X axis is a real frequency. So this is generated from the, you know, from the imaginary time data through the analytical continuation. So this is a real frequency data. This is a den local density of state of versus a real frequency. What you see is that at high temperature, on the Fermi surface, where which is omega equals zero, there's a there's quite a lot of state there. So this is a thermal metal, if you like. As the temperature gradually goes down, right at about at about the temperature of one over, I think one over should it be one, one, two, three, one over ten, you know, at the temperature about one over ten, this gray line at the Fermi surface, the on the Fermi surface, the density of state start to deplete it, start to vanishes, start to vanish. As the further you cool down, the vanishing is more pronounced. Until you go to temperature of one over 20 in this plot, the full gap opens. So this from one over 10 to one over 20 was corresponding to this red area, uh, sorry, not red, the, the yellow area we denote as a pseudo gap in a phase diagram. So once I hit the lower boundary of the pseudo gap, I enter the superconductivity. How do I know I enter the superconductivity? Because I see that the full gap opening in a fermion spectrum, I, in the same time, I can, measure, I can measure the pairing susceptibility of the fermions. So in a lower right chart, what's the pairing susceptibility of the fermions scaled in an XY form. So system size L to the power of, I think this is two, minus eta, eta is one quarter. So this is that's minus 
uh, this is minus two plus uh, minus two plus eta. This is why we get the L to the power of seven over four. And the X axis was this uh, uh, essential singularity form of the X, Y phase. So with this exponent, eta equals one over four, we can collapse the data. And the best collapse happens at the TC equals one over 20. So that means that what I'm seeing when the full Fermi open the full gap, there's an XY transition happens in the same time that my system enter in the XY phase. The Fermi, not the rotors, the Fermi enter to the XY phase in the realization of the Cooper pair. So that's what we can see. So that's also the model gives us. So let's go to the next page. So what I've been telling you uh, by yeah, now, yeah. sure, sure, sure. I have a question about the previous sure. slide. So the, yes. the, go to the previous slide. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the superconductor, what's the pairing function? Yeah, okay. This is S wave. Here is S wave. So this pairing was mediated exact explicitly by this coupling of between Fermi and the boson. So it's it's a it's a it's an interlayer S wave. So the spin part of the fermion is, is aligned, but uh, the, the layer uh, uh, indices form a singlet. So, so that's the, so we, we, we check, I mean, in a simulation, you can check different parent symmetry. We check, you know, this as we've uh, uh, even ex more extended. So it turns out in this particular model, that as we've I mentioned was the strongest. Yeah, so let's, let's go to the, so, 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 so that as we've was generated uh, the ferromagnetic fluctuation that way I was writing by hand into the model. So now if you want to have something else, something new, right? Something different, you can play with the game of choosing different uh, boson fluctuations. So what I've been showing you in the previous slides was a ferromagnetic. Nothing stops you to generate an anti-ferromagnetic fluctuation. So what I'm showing you here, this is an effort that I use an anti ferromagnetic transverse field IC model to couple with the fermions. So in this case, you know, what you can show is that now because the, because the boson wheel vector is pi pi, so the original Fermi surface was large, you know, in a paramagnetic phase when the transverse field is big, once the IC spin is ordered in an in a, in a anti-ferromagnetic manner, the fermion will, will respond that the fermion will form pocket. And here in this case, we see the Fermi non-Fermi liquid on the hot spot. So that's you know that's the, the model can give you this 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 this, this, this uh, different uh, degree of freedom not to play with. So 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 actually the so so what I'm showing in a, you know there, there, there's an expression of the bosonic stability. What I'm showing you here is that in this case we see the bosons still has um, you know has a linear omega but a q square. Uh, 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 dynamic exponent is, is z equals two, if you like, but uh, there's an overall no, renormalization or, or, or changes of the enormous dimension. There's an enormous dimension, which is one over eight. This one over eight has something to do with the number of hotspots. So this we can see. So this, you know, this was done, I mean, relatively early. So this was only the IC model. In this case, we have not, I mean, we could, of course, change this to the rotors and enhance the coupling to see what type of superconductivity. We just didn't get the time to do it yet. So, so this, what I'm saying is that the model gives you a lot of degree of freedom to do this. Let's, 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 let's keep going. Let's go to the next page. So that was the first, you know, where I mean, actually, so the, the, the first half of the first part of the talk. So the later half, I think we can go slightly quicker. So the later part was about until now, the bosons are still, you know, real bosons, you know, it's icing or rotor or whatever. So these are real bosons. But now if you want to do something more drastic, if you want to generate, for example, a situation of the violation of the Latinder theorem, if you want to, you know, break the Fermi surface, destroy the Fermi surface without introduce symmetry breaking. If you want to do that, you need to do something more. You need the something more you have to do is introduce gauge field. And that uh, it was uh, this second part of this first part of the, the, the talk. Let's go to the next slide. I think this part I will go very quick. So, so one of the one of the early model we come we start with, of course, this we learned from many people. I think Faka was in the audience. So we learned from I think Faka and Sneer, 
has a series of beautiful papers that we learned from them, of course, from previous analytical papers that we can generate the model to realize this orthogonal metal. So what is orthogonal metal? The model we, so the, so the model, let's start with the model. The model is that again, fermion F, HF, boson HZ, and here I introduce HG, which is a gauge field. So the model has three lines, you know, each of the term. The first line was the fermion matter field coupled to the, this, uh, in this case, the sigma icing matter as uh, gauge field. So the fermion, the fermion hopping will pick up a gauge field. The sigma Z is a, it's an icing gauge field. And the second line was the icing spin, the capital S was icing spin, it was an icing matter field, also coupled to an icing gauge field. And the third line was the icing gauge field. So I have this uh, product of four HZ spins and the subject with this transverse field. So this kind of very artificial models actually has very interesting physics. So the physics is realized in the following way that so suppose now I fix my hopping T, Fermi hopping T equals one. I fix my uh, icing matter field, the, the J is, is, is minus one. And I fix this capital K, which was the was which was a product, the plaquette term of the gauge field is also capital one, and the G, the fluctuation part, with which is 0.5. So this capital one, which larger than 0.5, is important because in this bare gauge field model, the gauge field is deconfined. I need a deconfinement. And uh, and uh, what I'm doing in this model is I tune the transverse field in the second line of the icing matter field. I tune the transverse field. What happened is that as a function of transverse field, as a function of transverse field, when the transverse field was small, the the firm so the so the so the so the so I think matter field is 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 not gauge invariant. The the fermion also not gauge invariant. What is gauge invariant is the composite object of the of the fermion matter field multiplied with I think matter field. So this two this composite fermion are gauge invariant. So what happened to the system is that when the transfer field is weak, this composite fermion form a well-defined Fermi surface. So this is a, the composite fermion is composed. I mean, right, right now the Fermi, the, the icing uh, gauge field is, is, is confined. So Fermi surface was, 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 was intact. So I have a Fermi, uh, I have a Fermi surface. Now as I, so this is, we call a normal matter. Now, if I gradually enhance the transfer field, what happened is that the, the, the gauge field will go through a, Higgs transition that uh, in the other side of the phase diagram, in the orthogonal metal phase, that the composite fermion is no longer composite. So the, the so the so the Fermi surface disappeared of the composite fermion. And this changing, this changing from a we will define a Fermi surface to a disappearance of Fermi surface has not has nothing to do with transitional symmetry breaking. So in a way, this is breaks Latin the theorem. So I destroy the Fermi surface without breaking the symmetry. So all I'm saying right now is just words. Let me show you the data. Let's go to the next slide. So, so okay. For for example, in the in the in the in the, in the upper in the upper left part. So what I'm plotting is the quasi-particle fraction of the composite fermions on the Fermi surface. So the Fermi surface I choose I can choose a point on the Fermi surface. Measure the quasi-particle fraction. And uh, and uh, what I'm showing you is here is that that, that quasi-particle fraction as a function of transverse field is gradually suppressed until I get to the transition and it vanishes. So there's no longer, you know, quasi-particle on the Fermi surface in the in the right part of the, of the phase diagram where H is larger than H C. So the 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 lower the lower upper chart is showing is showing us the 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 the, the, the magnetic susceptibility. Of the of the of the of the fermion matter field, the magnetic stability does not change across the transition. So the magnetic stability still has its largest value close to pi pi. This is because I purposely choose the Fermi surface as a nested shape. So what I'm showing you is that the Fermi surface, you know, which was intact when h smaller than h c, which has a pi pi instability, as I go across the transition, the Fermi surface vanishes, but the instability is still there. So this is a metal without Fermi surface. So let's go, let's directly go to the next slide. I think that's more, let's go to the next slide. So, okay, this is more directly shown in this chart here. So what I'm showing you here in the, in the upper three uh, plot, 
was a fermion uh, dynamic Green's function. I measured the fermion Green's function of the composite fermions, k and the tau. Tau is the imagined time correlation. And I used tau equals beta half to appro approximate the quantity particle fraction on the Fermi surface. So the upper three chart was showing you how the Fermi, uh, the quasi particle fraction happens to my Fermi surface. In the, in the left one, I have a very bright Fermi surface. And you see the nested shape, right? There's a pipe instability to this Fermi surface. And the middle one was at the critical point. So this weight is disappearing very fast. Now, if I go to the right part, the weight is completely disappeared. So there's no Fermi surface from this perspective. But if I plot the dynamical, dynamical spin, so the ability, the, dynamic, the spin spin correlation function, you know, uh, measure the fermion, the composite fermion spin spin correlation function between up and down, you know, between, uh, sorry, between SZ and SZ. I mean, this, so the, this NI up minus NI down is the SZ of the composite fermion. At one side, at one time of, and correlated with another side, another time. So this in, inter, integration gives me the suitability. The suitability always has a instability close to pi pi matter where I am along the first diagram. So that's the interesting thing. So this is the orthogonal mat. So this is the orthogonal mat. So, so this is, uh, you have to generate not only the, the, the icing field, you'll need the gauge field. So now let's go to the, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, of course, then, you know, we can, you, you can even do more. I think this part, I will go quick. You can even do more. You know, so you can keep adding lines with this, Hamiltonian. This is also inspired by the, you know, the series of beautiful papers by Snear and Fakker that, um, you know, the previous model only have three lines, fermion matter field, IC matter field, the little gauge field. Now I add another term, which was the explicitly the hopping of my composite fermion. I want to drag my fermion, you know, out of the orthogonal metal, give it an explicit fermion surface. So now I can even I even dope the system. You know, I still dope the system. So what what I'm I will go very quick. But what I'm want to say is that now used to be in a previous slide I have a normal metal to orthogonal metal. Now what I'm having is that I can have a so so in a phase diagram in a schematic phase diagram showing in the lower in a, in a, in the lower left I can have a situation where you know this um, this composite fermion. You know, I mean, so the, no, sorry, not the, the, the fermion matter field want to form this doped Dirac cone. These circles are the doped Dirac cones, but you don't see them. But the, the composite fermion forms a Fermi arc, and the gauge field was deconfined. So you can re realize this situation. Now, if you tune the, the system to, uh, towards this, again, the phase transition, on the other side of phase transition, what happened is that the composite fermion go back to itself has another, has a complete Fermi surface. So you can now generate basically Fermi arc to the full Fermi surface in this setting. So let's go to some data. Please go to the next slide. I think we can jump, we can jump. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, here. So what I'm showing you here, you know, in a, in a lower, again, in a lower, uh, in, in, a, in a lower right part of the, my uh, Fermi uh, spectral function, right? So in the panel A, this is the Fermi arc. This is inside this uh, deconfined phase that the Fermi have this arc. arc. So the Fermi surface is, you, of the composite Fermi do not even complete. And the panel B is, is, is the corresponding magnetic stability of the system. Again, it has, a, it has a ring close to pi pi. It's not exactly at pi pi because I didn't, it's not really perfectly nested, but it's close to pi pi. And the panel, this is the panel A, B. D, panel D, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a lower uh, row, what's a bigger Fermi surface, right? It's a bigger Fermi surface. Um, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I tune the hopping T in a phase diagram, it's a bigger, actually this is still deconfined, but, but this is a um, complete Fermi surface. And that Fermi surface also has this color. In the panel E has the same magnetic instability. So all this can be generated with this model design. So I think, yeah, let's, let's, let's keep going. Yeah. I think we can skip this, right? we can skip this. So, so we can generate Fermi arc and let's skip this. Let's go to the, the, the I think the next slide. Um, actually how I'm doing in time, William, how I'm doing in time. Okay, then let's, let's skip this, let's just keep going. Okay, let's keep going. So, 
I think this part, uh, I, mean, I think uh, Joseph will be interested, but let, let, anyway, we can talk later. Let's let's give this. Let, let me, I want to go to the next part. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, no, the next slide. All I'm saying, all what I'm saying was just for the fermions, Fermi surface coupled to different gauge field. So the, so the next few slides was about spin models, how we generate a similar situation. I mean, similar in the sense that uh, uh, similar quant um, exotic quantum phase transition and exotic phenomena associated with this phase transition. Can, can I ask a, a question about the previous part before you go on? Sure, sure, sure. So in the, when, when you get these Fermi arcs, so, right. so these are, you know, these are Fermi arcs in the composite object, which is gauge invariant, yes. right? Yes. And so what's, what's causing that? So you said the underlying fermions actually have a full Fermi surface, but something's going yes. on with the Ising spins that you don't see. I didn't quite understand what, what is making that happen. So what we know, what we know is that uh, in a deconfined phase mm -hmm. of the Ising gauge field, Mm -hmm. You know that that uh, deconfinement of the icing gauge field generate fluctuations. So these fluctuations um, move to the both to the icing matter field and also the the, the, the fermion matter field, right? So this fluctuation makes the comp computation of the composite Green's function. So I'm explained only in this phenomenological in this uh, you know observation. Uh, perspective. So what we know is that the confinement of the gauge field is important here. Okay, but the, the specific mechanism is maybe not so clear. Is that that's what you're saying? Not to me. Yeah, not to me. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. In fact, uh, you know, I, the, 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 the few slides I, I skip. So the arc, you know, I think there was one. Uh, so can you go, maybe let's go to the previous slide. In fact, uh, let's go to the previous slide. Uh, even previous, even previous. Even more so, one more, yeah, here. So actually, yeah, uh, sorry, can you, can you go down? So actually here, so you see this, um, <laughs> so, that, so, so the chart, you know, in the, in the right part is A, B, C, D, right? These are the, so A is the quasi-particle fraction. So what is plotting here was, uh, you know, for two different T, the T controls the, the, the hopping, for example, of the composite object. When the T is small, which is 0 0.3, the quasi particle fraction for this fixed system size for one particular system size has a vanishing weight close to zero and pi, but is very pronounced in the middle. Mm -hmm. So that was the arc. Now, if you plot this, you know, so, so uh, actually, this when I say this is a quasi particle fraction, this is come from approximation. This is a, I use the Green's function at the beta half to approximate. So, what is showing in the panel C in the corresponding plot was a real frequency spectrum. So we can generate a real frequency spectrum. And here you clearly see that, uh, you know, that circle was, was to denote this middle angles where there's a pronounced weight. And there's a gap between this circle to the other part of the pronounced weight. So that we, that, this is what we saw. This is what we saw, yeah. This has actually happened in a lower, in a phase diagram, you know, in the in 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 upper, Left phase diagram. Is it happens in the in the in the lower left part of the phase diagram? So let's yeah let's go. So um, yes here here yes. So so in a few few slides, I want to talk about this spin models. This is generated by another type of Monte Carlo simulations, but uh, it's also interesting. So the first model I'm going to show is this. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. The first model I'm going to show is this uh, so-called the BFG. So this is the uh, what is called the uh, Balance Fisher Gerwin model. It's a spin frustrated spin model put on the Kagomi lattice. So what I'm showing you here, you know, the two lines of the Hamiltonian is the same model, both in a spin description, spin one half description, or in a hardcore boson description. It's the same equivalent. So the S plus S manner <laughs> translated to the boson hopping on the Kagomi lattice nearest neighbor. The sum of the SZ in hexagonal in a, in hexagon generate the classical frustration to the model. Right? You have if you have six spins sum together, spin one half, the and the, with a square, the the, the 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 ideal situation was to have three up, three down. But which one are, which three are up, which three are down? They're the, they're the degeneracy. That's the classical degeneracy of this model. That's and uh, 
and uh, and uh, this was actually the original model. So what we added up to, upon this was the JZ prime term. So this is a term that coupled the spins with different with with adjacent adjacent hexagons. So turns out this is important for us easier to realize the spin liquid that was proposed from this original model. And we add a, 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 this as a longitudinal field, the HZ, the Zeeman field. This actually played the role of the boson chemical potential if you translate it into the hardcore boson language. So basically what I'm, what I'm telling you is that I have a Hagomi lattice model where, um, where this model I can tune from uh, you know the in a boson language when the boson has a stronger hopping, I have a superfluid phase. But if the interaction V is long is stronger than the hopping, I will generate a Z2 spin liquid. So this model gives me a Z2 spin liquid. And what this V prime does was to further help me to establish this Z2 spin liquid. And what the chemical potential does is that to tune the feeding from three up, three down, or three occupied, three empty to four up, two down, you know, different plateau. But this, uh, the different plateau is also spin liquid. So that's what I'm, that is what I, what I described verbally was this two phase diagram I'm showing you. This two phase, phase diagram was corresponding to the different chemical potential or different uh, Zeeman field. When the Zeeman field is zero, if I tune the X axis with the J plus minus over JZ was a boson hop, was the was the boson hopping versus the boson repulsion, and the y axis is the JZ prime over JZ. In this way, we can generate a D2 quantum spin liquid, and this is actually the odd. And this quantum spin liquid to, for, to, like, to go to both x and y directions will go to symmetry breaking phase. If I go to the x direction, when the x plus, when the J plus minus is large, I go to a ferromagnetic phase, a superfluid phase in the boson language. If the J prime was jz prime was large i go to different valence bond story that gives me different translational symmetry breaking pattern so that was the phase diagram and this phase boundary was determined from the simulation and the lower phase diagram is the same setting it's just now the chemical potential is different now my my field i polarize partially polarize the sz spins so when h equals 2 jz my hexagon used to be three up three down now it's four up two down but this more, this system still has jet degeneracy and the quantum fluctuation still gives me the quantum spin liquid phase. The difference is that now this spin liquid phase is even. So I will show you what I mean by even and odd. So, so we know the phase diagram and what I'm showing you on the right part of the plot was the spin response or the dynamical spin, so the spin, um, dynamical spin collision functions as a function of momentum and the frequency computed from Monte Carlo. This is computed, you know, actually at this uh, red dot along these red arrows of, of these two passes. Inside the spin liquid phase, but close to the phase boundary. So both red arrows for this odd and even spin liquid will generate me a wavelength spawn solid. So there will be a transitional symmetry break. So from this transitional symmetry breaking, what we saw is that the spin spectrum will close the gap. Indeed, and you can see at gamma point, the gap is almost closing. You close the gap. That means, that actually means, that actually means this wind spawn solid should be ferromagnetic, you know, should be translational, you know, it, it's, 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 it's actually homogeneous, right? It's close the gap at the gamma point. The, 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 the order of wave vector of the is VBS is, 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 is Q equals gamma. But there are difference between upper and the lower spectrum in the sense that the lower spectrum, the lower spectrum only close the gap of the gamma. So this is where the other wave vector of the valence bond is solid. But the upper spectrum actually has a, another minimal at M, M point in the middle of this uh, momentum point, which is a, which is a mid point of the gradient zone boundary. So this is actually where so this is so this endpoint in this case is actually where the corresponding VBS is ordered, and the, in fact the fact that it has an endpoint has a finite momentum point which close the gap actually means that in a Z two spin liquid the ions if you like 
C uh, translational pattern, which is um, half of the lattice. So this is actually the so-called translational fractionization of the onions. So this you can see from the spectrum that actually tells us that the two valence bond solid for this um, H equals zero case and H equals to two Z case ordered at a different, actually ordered at different wave vector. So, so, this is, so this is one part of one piece of the information. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, yeah, okay, uh, uh, yeah. Um, so, the, okay, so, so that was the slide, what I'm showing you in the previous slide was, the, was very, you know, quite few years back. So what is more recent is that, so this is actually the work we, 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 we collaborate with William, is that now, what I told you was the, from the spin liquid to the VBS transition. But how about from the spin liquid to the superfluid transition? How about this so-called XY star transition? What happened to the bosons at this XY star transition? In pre precisely what happened to the transport of the bosons at this XY star transition? So this is actually what we learned from William is that for the, for the two plus one XY transition or for, for this bus Hubbard model, if you like, if you measure the conductivity of the bosons, there, this conductivity, you know, conductance, you know, as a function of Magabara frequency, you know, has a CF, CFT description, has, has few terms. There were a universal term, which is called the sigma infinite. This is the universal term. There were this uh, T over omega to the power of three minus one over nu. Nu is a correlation length exponent. And there are some higher order terms. So if you plot the conductance, you know, you know, normalize with unit, with, with sigma q with this unit versus this Mazubara frequency. So you should see a decaying function. And this decaying function has a plateau. That plateau is this universal value. For the two plus one XY transition or for the Bose Hubbard model, this, this number has been worked out. This number is, I think William knows this better than me. This number is almost close to 0.36. So this is for the XY. For the for the rotor model or for the for the for the Bose Hubbard model, this is known. It's a universal conductivity for this transition of the bosons. So now the question is: if I go from a little spin liquid to a superfluid, not from a malt insulator to a superfluid, what happened to this conduct to this conductivity, to this conductance? That it that it still open the 36. So that's the question. And the, now this model, this model we wrote, the Kagomi model, can describe the transition. And they, they can answer this question. And what we found is that it's actually no longer this 0 0.36. It's actually no longer, not in an arbitrary way, it's no longer in some uh, very interesting way. Let's go to the next slide. So, so the, it changes, it changes. So, the, so for this, for, for my XY star transition, right? I still have the conductance still has three terms, in the, the constant terms and this power law term. And, uh, and uh, this constant term or the plateau term is a quarter of that universal value. It is a quarter precisely because of the fractionization in a spin liquid. Because spinon is, if you like spinon, is half of the magnon or spinon is half of the bosons. So the J current, each current is half of the bosonic current. The product is a quarter of that. And now how do we see that, right? We know, I mean, we, we, we learned this, uh, this beautiful, you know, CFT or the field theory type of prediction. How do we see that? We really go to compute this current, current correlation function on the model. This is from Monte Carlo simulations. What, you sh what, I, what we're showing you is this two chart in the lower part. The left one is for the even, uh, sorry, sorry, for the odd quantum spin liquid to the superfluid. The right one is for the even quantum spin liquid to the superfluid. So all you see, so there are so many data, so many data. So the data, the different uh, symbols means different temperature. The simulation again is performed at a finite temperature. So basically, as I go from, uh, you see, when beta is small, three hundred, I'm at a relatively high temperature. Go all the way to beta equals six hundred, I'm going to lower temperature. The curve gradually tuning from this 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 uh, this this uh, uh, downwards bending 
to the upwards bending. Between this downward bending and upward bending, there were there was a line. There was, there was one temperature which close to four hundred beta equals to four hundred was almost a, a, a flat curve, and that flat curve is very close to the plateau. That plateau value is showing here in the data. It's a quarter. It's I mean within error bar, it's a quarter of 0 0.36. So this is what we saw. Both in the, you know, this is in the odd spin liquid and and also in the even spin liquid. This both of them worked. And uh, and I think I can you go to next? Let's go to next slide. Yes. So now so so the difference the difference between this XY star transition or the quantum spin liquid to the superfluid transition with the mod insulated to the superfluid transition is not only a quarter difference because of the spin is ha carries half charge of the of the of the of the of the, the magnum. There's also the different shape of the curves. Now, if you look at you know the this you know in a in a, in a right in the left part was the previous data from William and his collaborators, that was for the uh, 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 a both Hubbard model for this XY transition, that all the curves, you know, as a function of um, as a function of uh, frequency, you know, bends in one manner, right? It goes down, and it's, if you extrapolate, extrapolate all these curves, you extrapolate this uh, t equals zero line. That flat that flat value is around 0 0.36. That was the universal value. It has one trend, but our data has two trends. At a high temperature, when beta equals 300, it bends downwards. Only when the temperature is low, when the temperature is 600, it bends upwards. So there's something more than just this universal conductivity. So what's, what is what are something more is a different energy scale or different temperature scale of the problem. So in our model, so if you see in the in the phase diagram, in the, in the schematic phase diagram in the in the in 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 upper right part, that I have three colors showing the quantum critical region. The upper one was a, was a, was red. The middle one, the T star, was pink, and the, the blue one, uh, the, 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 the the lowest one was blue. So basically, so the downwards bending was happened in this red area, quantum critical area, and the flatness happens in this T star area, and the blue was the typical behavior. So what's this, for example, what is this T star energy scale roughly corresponding to in, in, in this setting? So this T star, which is actually very low, beta equals 400. So this is temperature is one over 400. It's very low temperature. This is the very tiny Y zone gap of this model. So this system has a spin on excitations which carry the charge, but also has a Y zone excitations. Y zone has a very tiny gap. So only if I go down below this tiny Y zone gap, the spin on transport shows the typical behavior. It means that it had one trend as in the superfluid transition. If I go to the temperature scale where the Y zone start to pr proliferate, where right, the Y zone will stack, scatter the spin ons, it gives me this flatness and eventually gives me this bend downwards situation. It bend downwards. When I say the temperature is high, it's actually not high. One over 300 is still low. Right, it's still much lower than hopping T, for example. But it is in this energy scale that there are these Y zones will scatter for the scatter the spin ons. So that's the difference of this particular model with the superfluid model. So we so 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 this this one set of data tell you two things. One is this constant value, which is a quarter of the universal conductivity of the of the of, of the of the typical post. Uh, post hybrid model. Another case is that the different trend of the curve tells you there are different type of excitations in the system. So let's go to the next slide. I think I'm almost done. Oh uh, yeah. So when I said when I told you that the Y zone has a very tiny gap, actually you can see it from the simulations. So what I'm showing you here in the upper left two chart was the dynamic SZ SZ correlation function of the speed. So the SD, SD measure the Y zone pair correlation. The S plus, S minus measure the spin on pair correlation. So you can see the SD, SD correlation function. You can see, I mean, this data was, was kind of scared, kind of not so good quality. It's because it's hard. It's very low temperature simulations. You see the how, how low 
this continuum. This low, this continuum is at 0 0.04, right? It's very, the band, the Western band is very narrow at a very low temperature, it has a very even smaller gap. You should go to go below that lower gap to freeze the Y zone such that you can see the typical scaling, the, 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 the transport behavior. But at this scale, the Y zone will scatter with the spin lines. That's why you see this different trend. So I think with this, I, I think I can stop here. I, I'm maybe already too much of the time. I, 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 will, I will stop here and just we can discuss a bit. So I think you are asking for this uh, uh, for this uh, uh, non fermi liquid part, right? Um, maybe let's go let's go back let's go few quite a few slides back. Can we go? Um, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it shouldn't be. Yeah, um, all, all the way, all the way back. It means uh, quite a few years, quite a few slides back. Yeah. So. And I think probably we, we can go to one more one one more slide slide back. Uh, no, uh, you know, oh yeah, here here. So, yeah, indeed. So you see, the model is quite artificial, right? The model has many parameters: the hopping t of the fermions, chemical potential, the j, the h, the k, and the g. So, we fix most of them, right? I mean, we so the so the so the hc are equals around the two. It's generated with the with the choice of the parameter as you show as you see in the middle of the slide. If you change them, of course the HC will change. Yeah, will change. We we have not um, we have not done the exhaustive exhaustive search, but but the point the, the, the point here is, is the following. So the point here is that um, you know the for the fermion part, you know you, you want to have a fermion surface, so the hopping unit is set to equal to one, and you we actually dope the fermion metal field a little bit to have a rounded fermion surface. You know that's why we don't have the we do not have the nested one. I think in one of the work by by, by Sneer and the and the Fakir, they have this nested one. I think to generate this Dirac cone eventually, but here we dope it a little bit. Um, and then uh, and then the, the, the third line, the capital K and the G. So the capital K, so this is, so the third line HG is another way of writing this little gauge field. It's like a, the, the Tori code model, basically. It's a Tori code model. You know, when you, when you have the K is larger than G, you are in the topological order the phase of the Tori code model. So you want to have that. So that's why we chose K equals one, G equals one half. And with this setting, we, we start to tune the transverse field. So now if you still keep, especially if you still keep your Tori code model in the same phase, you can make the G even slightly larger or the K is even larger. You will see the same physics, but the HC, of course, the quantity, the quality, quantitative number will change. Yeah, but the physics, I think is still the same. Hey, Jiang, it's William, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, nice talk. I probably have like a hundred questions because there's so much uh, nice material in there. So congratulations on all these works. Oh. Very impressive. Do uh, you ever sleep? That's, that's my first question. <laughs> at least, at my least my second that. question is, <laughs> my second question is, uh, if I go back to the simplest transition between a Fermi liquid and another Fermi liquid, I guess, uh, the spin, the, the ferromagnetic yes. split at Fermi yes. surface, yeah. we have this Ising transit, well, not Ising, because we don't really know what it is, but um, yeah. yes. So the critical point there is, is obviously modified by the Fermi surface. Yes. Um, in your simulations, okay, so I see uh, you have the correlation length exponent, right? Up there, your- So, uh, your... so what I, so, so this number on the phase diagram actually showing the following information. So you see there's a, this, uh, this uh, blue crosses. Those are the phase boundary of the pure transverse field acting with the cell. Transition was around 3.044, so that we know. And these red symbols are the coupled system. Mm -hmm. And this function, so of course the HC changes, right? the HC changes. But more interestingly, this power law, this Tn of H, which goes as H minus HC to some power, this power actually changes from the icing value to this 0 0.77. The icing value, I think, is 0 0.63. So 
So the so this 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 number is z times mu. This number ch changed. Yeah. So extract other exponents. So yeah. I mean, a natural one would be maybe the order parameter exponent, right? Because yeah. you have a ferromagnet that's appearing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's yeah, small yeah. coupling. So do you see also that being uh, modified. For example, the anomalous dimension is very small in the Ising transition. Yeah. With the fermions included. Um, well, first of all, is there some uh, theoretical predictions? Yeah, there the is. Order so parameter. There, there is. I mean, I did, I did not have this. Uh, I think there was. I think. Can you just go to the very last slide? I think there was some down somewhere down there. I have uh, some slide. Uh, I think can you just go. Can you, can you just go down? Oh no, uh, go up. No, not this one. Just oh, I see. I'm sorry, I didn't put it here. So maybe, maybe. Let, okay, let, let's go to the original one. Let me just, let me just, um, let me just try to say this in words. So there are predictions. I think if you, I think the prediction here, um, the prediction here was that if we compute the icing dynamical susceptibility as the as the but the dynamical right mm -hmm. in a quantum critical region, it has a it shows power law as a function of temperature, as a function of the transverse field, as a function of momentum, as a function of uh, frequency. I mean, the, the susceptibility will diverge in this very complicated power law form. So what we saw was that it indeed diverge, but there is a non-negligible damping part. So, mm. so I think it was too abstract. So what I'm saying is that the susceptibility, you know, for the pure bosons, it's just usually it's one over, you know, omega to some power plus Q to some in this case. Mm -hmm. The Z equals one, so it should be omega. I think if I remember correctly, it's one over omega squared plus Q squared. So Z equals one for the IC. What we saw no, was but there's that, a there's a modified power. I mean, it's Z yes, equal one, yes. but yeah, so this yes. omega squared plus Q squared is raised. Yes. To some yes. What we saw was one over omega squared plus Q squared bracket with another exponent. Exponent is associated with an opposite dimension, which is larger than the pure icing one. It's, if I remember correctly, that exponent, that's another dimension is around 0.1 or something. One, okay. So, like and, uh, so, so one over omega squared plus Q squared with some exponent plus a damping term. The damping term scales with, if I remember, was omega over omega squared plus Q squared square root. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, yeah. So, so we, 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 damping. Yeah, we saw that, we saw those guys, yes. Yeah, I, I just didn't put, put it here. It was in a, in a table in a paper. Mm -hmm. yeah. And here, I guess what's nice is that there's no uh, there's no dome, there's no like phase that masks this critical point, right? I mean, which tends to happen in many situations. But here, the, so, the quantum critical point you're claiming is there to be probed, just naked critical point. Um, okay, so the honest answer is the following: This is finite temperature simulations. With the lowest we go, we have not seen. The, the phase emerge and mask that the, the critical critical point. Mm -hmm. What happened at really if if I go ten, you can always go ten times low if you want. What happened there? I don't know. Yeah, but that's maybe less important. I mean, if you see a scaling regime, right, for right, right, re right. reasonable temperatures, then that's already good. I mean, right, what happens right. at uh, ten to the minus nine Kelvin or whatever? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the lesson right. we learned what we learned is that actually one should not. Put this spin fermion, spin fermion coupling term should not put this C too large. If you put this C too large, usually, I mean that was in the rotor story. When I enhance it four times larger, I have a super, super, uh, uh, super conductivity phase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. So th there is a coupling between fermion and bosons. You shouldn't have it too too strong. Yeah, because in the rotor story, you have two situations: one where you have a critical point. And the other one where you have the superconducting dome. And can yes. you just remind me which parameter you changed? Yeah, 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 yeah. In the two scenarios. So maybe Joseph. That was just, this uh, C. That was this coupling strength. This uh, rotor next. Uh, yeah, let, let's go to the next page. So, uh, yeah, I was yeah, too, I was here, too quick. Here. You see, you see here. So there's this H hat Q R dash F. This coupling yeah, term. Yeah. It was a K over two, right? Yeah, yeah. In this story, right now in this plot data corresponding this capital K equals one. Mm -hmm. Now, the next slide, the capital K is four. That's the only difference. Okay. That's the only difference. So the fermion boson yeah. coupling. Yeah. 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 
at the microscopic level, that's the only difference. Yes. Okay, nice. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, great. So, Dan, I wanted to ask a question. So, you, you didn't get to talk about it, but this uh, U1 model, right? That the U1, you can find phase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has to, so, it says I can control your, your slides, I'll just go there. Sure, sure. Yes, yes. Conveniently. Yeah. Uh, there's no choice to answer. No, yes, that's correct. Yeah, so I, I was just curious because so did yeah. you, I wanted to know whether you have exponents. Yeah. So is what is this? So so this is actually so so the so we had a there was a collaboration with Parker. Actually, we 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 learned you know from 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 him and the Tarum that we can you know put this you know in this in this plot of the lattice that these blue balls are the fermions, the the, the, the yellow balls are the are, are the UN gauge field. We can couple the UN gauge field to the fermion Hopkins and give the UN gauge field dynamics. That generates this phase diagram, which you know in this in this panel B, that the, the y axis is different the fermion flavors. The x axis was the was the j. I think j was in front of the angular momentum of the rotor of this UN gauge field. So so now you have this UN deconfined phase, and the, when the j is large, the UN gauge field will become confined, and you generate a symmetry breaking phase. Depends on the different number of fermion flavors, you get VBS or antiferromagnetic phase. So this plot, this this chart was about this uh, this uh, this uh, from how how the transition goes from the U1 deconfined phase to the VBS phase. So this actually I learned from uh, you know Mihail Shira and uh, and the Lucas that um, I mean I think I think I also learned from 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 you Joseph and I think we discussed with William on this. So that this transition was should be described by the QED3 gross Noel. And the, how do we see that? So actually, so there's too many data. So what I'm showing you in this, in this middle lower chart was the correlation function of the spin spin and the dimer dimer of the fermions, how it shows power law decay at this transition point. And from this power law decay, we can extract the scaling dimension of these this, this operators. And that was summarized you know, in a in a in a in a in a in a right part of the of the the, the plot, this is the y-axis is the scaling dimension x-axis is the one over the fermion flavor numbers. So of of course, of course you see the data was very you know in a qual you know poor quality you know, with huge error bars and because this simulation is hard we cannot go to very large system size, but there's a clear separation. These blue symbols, I think the blue symbols is for the VBS. Scaling down. and the red symbols is for the antiferromagnetic scale. And they see clear asymptotic, they see clear different limit. One is going to the two, one is going to one. According to this large end prediction by Lucas and Mihail. So it's consistent with this prediction. And uh, that two prediction is one of this blue dash line and one of this green dash line. The other two lines was for the pure gross Noel X Y same level of this large end com com uh, calculation. So what I what I want to show from this plot is that this QED three gross Noel X Y, you know, has looks to us has different trend of the pure gross Noel X Y as a function of fermion flavors. That's I think that's the message we can read from okay. this. Okay, we should probably. Yeah. Uh, Stop here. We're a little behind schedule, so uh, let's stop and let us uh, thank Yang again for a very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.